Good evening. It's dark all of a sudden. <laughs> Man, was it dark when we came in here? Did I just miss that? That's crazy. All right. <laughs> Talking tonight about, um, we'll give Ken, he was not lying. I had not yet sent it to him, so I'll give him <laughs> a minute to get it up there. Uh, we're talking tonight about a place to belong, and specifically about the people of God, God's people. Turn to First Peter chapter two. First Peter two is where we're going to at least base our thoughts tonight. When we think of the word people, when we use the word people, we tend to use it in kind of a generic way. We might ask, "How many people?" are here in the auditorium tonight, just kind of a general people. But in the ancient conception, and really just the Eastern conception of people, of community, you weren't, you weren't a person separate from a people. You were a person because you were a part of a people. So you, you were a person because you belonged to this tribe or to this belief system, or you were this God's worshiper. That's what defined your personhood. It wasn't necessarily an individual personhood. It was, we are the people who fill in the blank. And I'm not sure if if moving away from that is a good or bad thing, but either way, what we do want to do when we read something in the New Testament about being the people of God, or the Old Testament, is to remember, when he says people of God, He's not just talking about generic people who have something to do with God. He's talking about people who specifically are God's people. That is what makes them a people. That's what gives them their identity as individuals, but even more so, more importantly, as a group. And I think you'll see that some as we go through tonight. In 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, Peter says, But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So our previous existence as a people was one of a shadowy, dark non-existence. We didn't exist. But then we're called out of that darkness into his marvelous light, and we become a people. We become persons together. We become a people. And that has really big implications, according to Peter, for who we are and what we do as a church, as God's people. So what we're going to do tonight is just break down these two verses into several points and just talk about some different implications of being the people of God. Remember, that's not just a generic term. That's a very specific technical term. The people of God is a specific thing that we are in continuation with the nation of Israel. All right, so the first thing, we are a particular people. This is kind of what we've been talking about, talking about it a little bit more, particular people. Peter says that we are a chosen race. So the people of God come from a covenant, right? Genesis 12, verse 1, God makes a covenant with Abraham, and from that comes God's people. But that covenant was made with a particular person, and that extended to a particular group of people. It was made with Abraham. And the same thing is true of us today. We are a chosen race. We are a particular people. In in verse 1 of chapter 1 here in 1 Peter, Peter starts off, he says, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. Elect exiles. Elect here and chosen in chapter 2 are just English, different translations of the same basic Greek word. We're elect, we are chosen by God. So keep that in mind and turn to Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. We're going to read several verses here in Romans 9, so one we need to turn to together. But while you're turning there, there is a connection in redemptive history in the history of how God has worked with humanity, between his people and being chosen, between his people and election. And this is something I think that we miss. In in Psalm 105 and verse 43, it says, So he brought his people, his people, out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. Remember that psalm, the, the book of Psalms is 
poetry, right? It's Hebra- Hebraic poetry, Hebrew poetry. And their poetry didn't, wasn't a, a parallelism of sound like ours is. It doesn't rhyme line by line. Instead, it's a parallelism of thought. So you have the same thought set in different ways, line by line. So this verse right here is poetry. The book of Psalms is poetry. So notice that the first line, he brought his people out with joy. He's saying the same thing in the second line. His chosen ones with singing. His people are his chosen ones. They have joy. They are singing. In other words, there's a connection between his people and being chosen. And this doesn't just pop up in Peter. This is something that has been in existence for as long as God's people have existed. You can also see it in Psalm 135 and verse 4. It says that the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself. Israel has his own possession. He's chosen him, Jacob, the, the nation, for himself. His own possession. So remember that, remember that language for a later point, a possession? We'll come back to that. But when it comes to election, lots of ink, lots of theological blood has been spilt over the topic of election over the topic of predestination and and being chosen. And it brings up a lot of questions, right? Do we have free will? Are we forced to do things? Does God make us sin? It brings up a lot of questions that are important. And it is important to discuss and defend free will. But even more important than that is not neglecting the biblical doctrine of election. In some sense, we are chosen. We are predestinated. We are particular people. And here in uh, Romans, look just a couple chapters later. I think it's up on the screen, but you can also look at it if you're in Romans 9. Romans 11 and verse 5, Paul says that it's not just in the Old Testament, but also right now, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Chosen by grace. The concept of election is explicitly found in at least 12 New Testament books. So this is something that is all over the New Testament. And if the first thing that we think about when we hear the words chosen or election or predestination is false doctrine, if that's the first thing we think about, then we miss the New Testament point. At least that's, for me, that is the first thing I think about is what, where people have gone wrong on that. But if you're like me, I think we need to reform that. We need to to become better and live into what Paul is actually saying, that we are actually chosen. Here in Romans chapter 9, he makes it clear, you and and I, we have been chosen by God. Begin in verse 19. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? In other words, how in the world is God going to get me in trouble if he makes me do what I do? That's the thought here. And then Paul defends this. He says, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? In other words, God can do whatever he wants. And he keeps going. What if, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy? which he has prepared beforehand for glory. And now, notice this. Even us whom he has called, not for the Jews only, but also for the Gentiles, as indeed he says in Hosea, remember from this morning, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Now, in context, what he's saying here is my people will be my people. And you cannot stop that from happening. So that's how Paul applies this from Hosea. It's a very strong stance on the power and the sovereignty of God. My people will be my people, and don't get in my way. Now keep reading. He says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been left, or we, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. In other words, if God hadn't given us offspring, we would no longer exist. This is, an, this is a very strong stance regarding the sovereignty of God. And, but the main point that we want to draw out of this is that God alone determines this boundary. We don't get to determine who's in and who's out. We, we can and should do our best to try to figure out, especially whether we are in and out, right? We're supposed to judge righteously. We have to do that. But that's not ultimately for us 
to decide. That is completely and totally and utterly dependent on him, not on us. So I affirm that we have free will. We all would say that, I think. And that's important to talk about, like I said. And I think Paul would have affirmed it as well. But if that's all that we focus on when we think about election, then we're missing the point. There's a reason Paul never clarified his statements just right away and said, but but wait, 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 wait. Remember all this stuff. No, he just says, you're chosen. Peter says, we are a chosen race. So if we can't let that stand by itself, then what have we done with the scriptures? We have to take that. Now, if we do let it just stand and just, and like I I want to be very clear, I'm not saying we can't nuance it more, talk through what it actually looks like. But if we do let it stand, what does that say for us? What does that say about us? Well, it tells us that we are incredibly important to God. He chose you. And he chose me. God did. God chose us. That should give us importance and value. It should also give us purpose because he chose us for a reason. We'll talk more about that later on. But on the other hand, the fact that we are chosen because of the free grace of God, not because of what we've done, but because of Jesus, that should also humble us. That should also Remind us that there's no place for pride in this. We're not chosen because of how great we are. We're chosen because of how great he is. So we are a particular people. We have been chosen. Second thing from this text, God's people, we are a priestly people. Peter says that we are a royal priesthood. I want to talk about both of those words. First, royal We are a royal priesthood. What's interesting, and I hadn't noticed this until studying for this, but the words or the concepts of royal and priest are connected multiple times in the New Testament. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, it says that Jesus made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. Royal priests, a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. In chapter 5 and verse 10 of Revelation, it says, You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So Jesus, remember how we've talked about his, how he redefined power? Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians especially, how, in 2 Corinthians, how Jesus, by his suffering, redefined what power looks like. It's not fighting and killing people, it's giving and dying for people. That's what real power looks like. So Jesus revolutionized the concept of a kingdom. He revolutionized the concept of a king, of royalty, through how he lived and how he died. So that's royal. Now let's bring in priests. We are a royal priesthood. So we've been talking about how we are the people of God. Now what's interesting is that the word people, the word translated people, is the Greek word laos, laos. Now, that's the word from which we get laity. Laity. Remember, we have this contrast in our society between clergy and laity. Usually when we talk about laity, we're contrasting them with the experts in a field, whether it's medicine or law or the Bible. They're the laity, so they're not the clergy. But that's actually not what the Bible, the biblical conception of the laity, of people, is. Laos, the laity, is the priesthood. The people of God are the priests of God. They're not, they're not contrasted with it. And in fact, the, the people, all Christians, are not only the laity, they're also the clergy. We're actually both. We're the laity and the clergy. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 18, it says, this is Paul talking, and he says that this happened so that they might turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The word place there is the word from which we get clergy. It just means a a place or a a possession, an assignment. So when you are a Christian, when you become a Christian, when you become part of the people of God, you become a people, right? You become laos, you become the laity, but you also become the clergy. We are actually both, not some of us are one and some of us are the other. We're both clergy and laity, as the people of God. He's brought us together. We are all priests underneath our high priest, Jesus. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, because this this is one of my favorite thoughts that we're talking about tonight. We're all priests under our high priest, Jesus. Remember in, in 
verse 5 of chapter 2, 1 Peter. Peter says that we are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. So the point of our priesthood is to offer up these spiritual sacrifices, these acceptable sacrifices. That's, that's the point. But what is the sacrifice? What are the sacrifices that we give up? Well, in Romans chapter 12, it tells us that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So remember that we are now the temple, right? We are the temple under the new covenant. That's what was physical has become spiritual in us. So just like they worshiped in the temple, we worship in our bodies. We worship by sacrificing our daily lives, how we live in our bodies to God every day. And, and the example for that, the pattern that we have for that is our high priest himself. So that's what, that's what being a priest is right now. Romans chapter 12, presenting our bodies to God as a living sacrifice. That's what the priest did. They sacrificed to God. So that's what a priest looks like today. But what's our pattern for that? Well, it's our high priest, Jesus. In Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 9, it says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. So, again, he's, he's changing our paradigm here. He's taking what was in the old and making it something new. It's not, it's not the sacrifices and offerings that he wants. It's us. It's what we do in our bodies. He says, Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, all of those offerings, they're offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. So this is what our priesthood looks like. doesn't look like all those Old Testament sacrifices. doesn't look like it's, it's only centered in this room. Our priesthood is modeled after Jesus. It's modeled after coming to do God's will in our very bodies. That's our sacrifice. That is our acceptable worship. That's what being a priest looks like. That's what being God's person, God's people looks like. Out in the world, when we separate tonight, we go out into the world, and we are all living sacrifices to God. We're all priests. Now, third thing, pure. I just remembered that I forgot to talk about that guy, so <laughs> sorry about that. But <laughs> that's what we normally think of priests. But the point is, not exactly the case. Not, not that we're trying to put people down who believe in this, right? That's not the point. We're not trying to, to be antagonistic toward people, but we do want to do what the Bible says and be what the Bible says we should be. All right, third thing, purity. This is also in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says that we are a holy nation, a holy nation. But also, if you're there in 1 Peter, keep reading in verse 11. Skip down there because Peter continues this thought, holiness. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. So we're sojourners and exiles in our nations here. Here in America, we are sojourners and exiles. But our holy nation lives differently. Abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So live differently, Peter says. Be different. Be pure, unlike the people who are around you. Now, we're turning a lot tonight, but turn with me again to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6. This is another powerful, powerful text. What we find with the people of God is that purity and holiness are not only part of our identity. They're also part of our purpose. So we are the pure people of God. That's who we are. But it's also what we are supposed to be. In other words, you are this. You are a holy nation. Now live like it. Take that and live it out. Now, this is, this is part of the point of our particularity. This is part of the reason why we are chosen. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, it says that he chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy and blameless before him. So part of the reason why we were chosen is so we would be holy. This is part of the point of it all. 
Now, here in 2 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 16, Paul asks, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, don't miss the progression of thought here. Verse 16, since we are God's people, that's the thought here, we are God's people, so because of that, verse 17, we must live as God's people. You are this, now live it out. And so that, verse 18, if we do that, we become truly God's people. You see that? 16 through 18, that's the progression of thought. You are this, now live like it so you will actually be it. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 7, it says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. What a thought. I I, I don't know what that looks like. I, I know it doesn't look like my life. Bringing holiness to completion. But that's what we're called to be and to do, to bring holiness to completion. We're supposed to be pure. We are a nation. Together, we are the people of God. That makes us a nation. But we're supposed to be a pure nation. Flip over a few pages to Titus chapter 2. Shouldn't be too far away from 2 Corinthians. Titus 2, and we'll read a little bit more here. Paul's talking about the grace of God. And he says that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. So renounce it. That that means take it out of your life. Renounce worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. To purify for himself a people for his own possession. His people, God's people, were purified to be that. So this is what this, our holy nation is all about. This is what it's about. It's the adjective holy. It isn't just a, a secondary description of our nation. That's not just one of the, the tags that we put for our nation. It's what makes us a nation. It's what separates us from everybody around us. We're pure. We're holy. We are God's people. Now, that's not a comfortable place to be. It's not a comfortable place to live because it requires that we be different. Holiness necessarily brings in the concept of difference. We're going to talk differently than the people around us. We're going to dress differently. We're going to act differently. We're going to do different things. Like Peter says in in another part of the book, He says that the Gentiles who were around these people, around the holy nation, couldn't understand why they were living the way that they did. Why they didn't run with them in the same flood of dissipation, Peter says. The the same wild lifestyle. Why don't you live like us? I mean, last year you came with us to the Festival of Zeus and we we had a great time, right? So why don't you come this year? You too good for us this year? That's embarrassing. It says that, that they made fun of them for it. They mocked them. But that was worth it for them. Because... Even though they weren't a people, they had become a people. And their people was a pure people. Now, I'll leave you with this question tonight. Is that what your life looks like? Is that what my life looks like? Is that what our life as a people looks like? Are we pure? Are we holy? Are we different? It's a a big ask to bring our holiness to completion. But it's what we are called to be and to do. Now, if you have something you need to make right publicly tonight, won't you do it as we